This is Bess Williamson recording Disability as Social and Speculative Design in the 20th and 21st Century. So this lecture gives somewhat of an overview of the place of disability in relationship to design professions in the U.S. from the mid 20th century um, more toward the present. Asking a little bit um, the question of what kind of design is design related to disability? Um, uh, we often think, when we think of disability in relationship to design, of accessibility, um, of things like wheelchair ramps and, um, and bathrooms. More recently, we can think of digital kinds of forms of access, like captioning, um, you know, alt text, and so on. Um, but I start with this image of a wheelchair in a stop-motion photograph, kind of wishing across the camera span to challenge a little bit of the thinking around disability in relationship design. Um, thinking about the fact that it does relate, of course, to these very familiar, kind of very practical forms of design, um, the wheelchair ramp and so on, that we can easily recognize, that we expect to be marked by signage. Um, and that is ubiquitous, even if often those things don't work as well as we might hope they would, right? The, the ramp is inconveniently placed or the um, accessible elevator is broken at the subway and so on. Um, this image comes from a, an architecture manual from the 1970s um, designed by an architect named Ronald Mace um, and intermixed with these very practical things about the measurements of ramps and doorways and so on are these sort of sepia toned um, stop, stop motion images and they make us think a little bit about the ways in which design for accessibility is also a conceptual category, right? A way of thinking about the world and how it works. And so we'll see in the examples today, some of the practical concerns and ways that designers have approached disability, but also some of the conceptual designs. And we might think as, um, of them as, as rethinking what design is itself in relationship um, to the public. So we begin, however, a little bit earlier in the 20th century, thinking not so much about disability, but thinking about design and its attitudes toward the body. Modernism, as we've covered in this class, um, was often in pursuit of the functional. Um, but the functional itself is subjective, right? Whose functions, um, who gets to define those functions, and who defines who um, is the subject of design? So Le Corbusier, the noted French architect who um, described the house as a machine for living in, who proposed um, you know, clean, open, and clearly functional spaces, also proposed a measurement system based on the human body, thinking of this as standardizing the space needed for each human being. So his proposal was called Le Modular, or some called it Modular Man. Um, that he proposed as an alternative to the like inches versus metric system, that is a new measurement system, um, but it was based on this figure. And even from this very beginning, we can consider how uh, kind of subjective this image is, that um, you know, it's a, this illustrated sort of image of a figure, right, rather than something that seems more scientific or anatomical. Um, and in fact, Le Corbusier you know, uh, proposed this as the standard, but he used as the basis for it a, a tall man in his office who he considered to be kind of admirable. So even from the beginning, the question of whether this is for a general um, average person or someone specific um, remains. But more than anything, we can think of this as a, a quote unquote average and therefore able-bodied male figure as a kind of basic building block representing everyone. Um, other designers adopted sim similar approaches, maybe with some more flexibility. Henry Dreyfus, an American designer, um, after World War II, introduced a range of guides that he called designing for people, um, or the, in other versions, um, the measure of man, um, in which he introduced people in various poses, interacting with the built environment, and suggested rather than a singular um, measurement, a range of measurements. So if you look closely at these little numbers around them, they tend to um, identify uh, you know, a range of, of measurements from the smallest percentile for the largest percentile. But nonetheless, the image kind of echoes with Le Corbusier's modular in suggesting 
an able-bodied masculine figure as kind of the center of design. Um, Dreyfus uh, did have a female figure as well. But if you look at the small text here, you might notice that um, Dreyfus did include some variation. So first of all, he says the average adult man, including 97.5 and two and a half percentile. So he suggests that kind of the most common numbers are between the, that range. So he is accounting for larger, smaller um, figures, perhaps not the range of abilities that we might imagine. That said, he also lists the percentage of users who are left-handed, who are colorblind, who are hard of hearing, and who wear glasses. So from um, in introducing the system, he does suggest that designers should keep in mind a variation among their audience. That said, disability is really not on the radar for um, for designers in the mid 20th century. When they're thinking about standardization, when they're thinking about function, they don't tend to include disabled populations. Instead, if we consider, you know, what were disabled people doing at this time to operate in the, in the world, to um, make their world functional, there's often um, a, a significant emphasis on adaptation for oneself, right? So sort of do-it-yourself approaches. So here are two documents of that. On the left, a photograph of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the U.S. president um, during the 1940s, who um, used a wheelchair. Uh, Roosevelt had polio and was paralyzed in his legs. He was very rarely photographed in his wheelchair. Um, was sort of uh, a, a, an unspoken rule with the press at the time. But here he is at his own home, um, and you can see a little bit that behind him, these French doors have no threshold, right? So they're completely flat. He also installed windows quite at a, quite a low height so that he could easily see out the window. So he, as a very privileged, you know, white man from a very wealthy family in America, was able to design his own environment for his wheelchair. But there's no sense of kind of a public form of design. Similarly, on the right, these are pages from a magazine for polio survivors, people who might have a range of different kinds of paralysis with um, homemade do-it-yourself ideas, things like rubber bands to hold open um, a book or a head stick for painting for people who are paralyzed in their arms. Polio was a significant um, disease that affected a generation of people and often left long-term disability and did a lot to make way for these kinds of changes. But as of the 1950s, they remain a personal, um, a personal responsibility rather than something that is on the design profession. This really starts to change in the 1960s and 1970s with the emergence of a disability rights movement. So here are some photographs of some of the people who were involved in that movement. An important center for that movement was in Berkeley, California. We may be familiar with overall changes that happened in Berkeley in the 1960s with major protests and anti-war movement and ethnic studies um, and racial justice movement that are happening there. And the um, disabled students at Berkeley were also um, organizing among themselves. So on the left, you see two of these men who were involved in this organization that emerged in Berkeley, Herb Wilsmore and Ed Roberts. Ed Roberts on the right is often described as kind of the um, the father of the American Disability Rights Movement. He was a very significant figure. Um, and as you can kind of tell from the photograph, he was significantly paralyzed. Another polio survivor, he was paralyzed in basically all but his face and one toe. So he had attended high school by um, by telephone, so sort of, you know, resonant with our current lives, um, and then agitated to have space to live at the University of California at Berkeley. Um, he and Wilsmore and a group of other students lived in a special dormitory on the top floor of the campus medical center. And they were of this generation, you know, who had been taught to do it for themselves, to, to fight for what they needed. Their parents had done a lot of this work. Um, they were kind of on their own, but they they took from the politics of the time and demanded not only success for themselves, but for all disabled people. Um, and so for um, they, they uh, participated in the founding of an organization called the Center for Independent Living. On the right hand side, this is a publication from the center um, that shows on its cover the process of a group of disabled people kind of surveying the landscape, identifying places where there's a need for curb cuts, uh, virtually unknown at this period. So you can see them sort of traversing a curb. You have two wheelchair users being assisted by others. The wheelchair user in the front who's wearing a head cap 
um, with a stick on it is Hale Zukas, who became kind of a major figure in designing access in the San Francisco um, uh, commuter rail BART system, as well as in the city of Berkeley, um, being pushed by his assistant, Eric Dibner, um, with another uh, member of the team. And on the far left of the photograph, you can see a man holding a white cane. So there are blind participants in this as well. And they work together to demand that the city of Berkeley not only incorporate curb cuts, but then design them so that they're usable both by wheelchair users and blind people. Uh, uh, a curb cut is a challenge for a blind person who needs to be able to detect that the curb has ended. So they actually designed the curb cut to be outside of the main walkway so that it wouldn't um, just, uh, cause a problem for blind people. So you have these coalitions of disabled people um, picking up on the politics of the moment, becoming leaders and becoming involved in city planning, in architecture and so on. So the story that I've told so far is kind of of a tension between the design professions who are mostly interested in a standardized body and an activist world that is pointing out the variations, right? First of all, it's not just one disabled population, right? But that there are multiple needs within that group, that there's a need for infrastructure, um, not just personal um, assistive uh, technology. So up until the 1970s, there's really not a lot of interaction between the design professions and this rights movement. Um, so what I'll, I'll describe in, in this lecture are some of the moments when designers do start to adopt an awareness of disability into a kind of mainstream approach to design. Um, and particularly they're picking up on, right, some of the arguments that are going on in the design world in this period, right? That um, those images from Berkeley are from the early 1970s. Victor Papanek's design from the, for the real world is published in 1974, in which he makes an argument that the mainstream professions of design are not serving real needs. Right. Um, he calls the industrial design profession one of the most dangerous ones in the world and talks about the over commercialization of design. The cover image of his book suggests a kind of physical toll that American and Western products are um, are taking out on the, the rest of the world. And Papanek specifically described design for disability as kind of an important area of rethinking um, uh, design priorities. Um, he included in um, a series of charts that were included in some of the editions of Design for the Real World, this chart which suggests at the top, we are all handicapped, right, and, and draws some design comparisons to um, between children, disabled people, um, and others who are kind of outsiders, prisoners and soldiers, um, people who are racial minorities, as all groups that are not being served by design children, young people, and quote unquote grown-ups are all experiencing a kind of outsider position to design. Um, and so uh, Papanek is considering, you know, the, the shared design concerns of a wide range of marginalized people. Um, and Papanek oversaw a lot of design workshops that focused on public needs. And one of them in Sweden in 1968 um, produced the initial design that became the international symbol of access. So on the left, Suzanne Kefed, a Danish design student who was attending this workshop in Sweden, developed this pictogram of a wheelchair, right? The original idea was, you know, that like other symbols that have, you know, for example, a fork and knife for a restaurant, right? That this um, pictogram of a wheelchair would represent wheelchair access. And the, the text here reads, where can I find a toilet, right? So um, suggesting the need for just clear signage about where an accessible toilet is. When the design made its way into the kind of um, international disability administrative world, um, Victor Montan of Rehabilitation International, an international organization, added a head, leading to somewhat of the kind of design question marks in this symbol, which is which part is the wheelchair and which part is a person. But nonetheless, the idea that you know, icon design is not just for logos, right? But that it's for public needs um, is something that's very much in line with Papanek's idea, but also taps into this emerging population and the architecture that serves them. 
Um, Papanek also addressed a kind of general usability in some of his books. Um, a later book of his, Design for Human Scale, identified things like handles and the ways in which handles could be a, a challenge for different kinds of hands, right? Whether they were simple little wooden knobs or elaborate kind of um, what he called dust catcher, sort of Baroque um, furniture, they, they, these all could be kind of difficult for the hand. But in, in, by contrast, he presented what he called a, quote, well-designed cabinet handle from Northern Europe, some sort of Scandinavian design with its very simple um, basic forms were, would be preferable. So Papanek is thinking about disability, not in functional terms, as well as style terms on a broad infrastructural basis with things like symbols, as well as on a, a minute kind of scale with the individual um, design decision around something like handles. And I, um, I present this to show kind of a, a backdrop, right, of, of designers' education, of advocacy around design change that makes its way into a more mainstream design practice. An unexpected, perhaps, product to incorporate into this lecture is the Cuisinart food processor, which is right, widely known as a kind of top of the line um, food chopper, slicer dicer, you know, kind of blender that was introduced in the 1970s as a sort of European professional style um, kitchen tool, you know, at the same time as sort of the popularity of Julia Child and other kinds of gourmet cooking on TV, um, this kind of product meets that market need. Um, however, it also represents the um, awareness of disability in the industrial design world. So Mark Harrison, who designed this processor, was a professor at the Rhode Island School of Design, RISD, um, in the 1970s and did a number of projects with his students around disability. So I'll just slow down in my lecture here to take a moment to look at this product and think about what connection it seems to have with disability, right? In no way does it identify itself clearly with symbols or images um, with something that might have to do with disability, nor is it a public utility, right? So this is not a subway station or a sidewalk, which would be something that would be legally required to be accessible um, starting in, in this time period. Um, instead, it's a consumer product, but it reflects research um, related to disability. So um, Harrison identified this, uh, I think in my next slide, um, Harrison identified what the benefits of this were in a, an archival image um, of, an, of an advertisement that are in his papers at the Hagley Museum in Delaware. Um, so here you see an advertisement for fresh and frozen fluffs, you know, uh, something that you can make with your Cuisinart. Um, but Harrison has handwritten in here the sort of research that went into it. So it says here, large handle, large paddle-like controls, gross motion versus fine finger acuity, large white letters on dark field for maximum contrast, and lettering on controls at angle of view when using product, right? So this is the language of occupational therapy, of physical assessments around things like gross motion versus fine finger motion, right? So research into arthritis, into manual and visual impairment um, are things that, that Mark Harrison is reading and as he develops this product, which has a large um, single column handle and these two big buttons, you just on or off, um, or pulse, you, if you click the on button, it just um, whirs for a, a brief moment to, um, rather than, you know, if we compare this to this typical American blender with like a thousand tiny buttons on it, right? This is absolute simplicity, a kind of elegance, right? That supports this position of this food processor as a top of the line, but it also incorporates this awareness. Now, Cuisinart, the Cuisinart remains somewhat of a kind of puzzle for us to think about, right? Harrison had done this research. He knew the language. He was very interested. In fact, he had had a childhood illness that had um, been a temporary disability for a while that he very much related to these concerns. But the image of the Cuisinart is something like this. The best keeps getting better, right? That it's always being represented as a sort of top of the line. It's a recommended product for wedding registration, right? It is in no way in its public presentation associated with disability. Sorry, just for zooming recording, the Oxo Good Grips vegetable peeler offers us a slightly different version of this kind of design story. Um, designed 
1989, um, this product reflects the disability experience of one of its designers, Betsy Farber, um, a designer and artist whose husband, Sam Farber, had owned a cookware company, so both of them were sort of design-minded. And um, But Betsy had lifelong arthritis, so she was very aware of the challenges of basic um, consumer products. She had developed various things of her own, like special towels and rubber handles that she would add to products. And in 1999, she and Sam approached Smart Design, a kind of emerging design firm in New York, and suggested these um, this line of vegetable peelers with an oversized rubber handle. Um, and they experimented together to um, produce this line, which remains one of the kind of most elegant, but yet very affordable, accessible um, kinds of um, kitchen tools. The oversized rubber handle, they specifically designed to resemble a bicycle grip so that you would kind of intuitively know how to grip it. It has these little fins that suggest functionality. Even the name OXO can be read upside down and backwards. You can use left or right hands. It has this ideal of a kind of broad base use, but it's based on the awareness of difficulty with handles um, that came from Betsy's own li life experience. But similar to the Cuisinart, um, everything about the Oxo gr Good Grips sort of presents itself as elegant and top of the line, highly functional, super sharp blades, yet protected, um, rather than something that's explicitly has any kind of name like, you know, Arthro Grasp or like, you know, independent living, pro you know, tech medical products. Um, this is the first Oxo Good Grips ad, which suggests kind of the way that it was represented. Gadgets you can grip are tools you can use. So a focus on usability, but without any specific reference to arthritis. That said, if we look at the ad kind of more closely, we see both hands that seem to be gendered male and female. We even see a hand with a Band-Aid on it, right? Suggesting perhaps at least, you know, kind of the imperfectness of cooking. Um, and some of the small words here, you know, start to suggest some of these, you know, functional issues. Hold the tools the way you want to hold them, not some way you're forced to hold them, right? So the sense that that kitchen tools can be limiting. And then within the body text here, um, they, they use a, a specific term. So the, the text reads, gadgets are gadgets, but good grips are kitchen, kitchen tools. The difference is in the handle. A universal design makes good grips easy for everyone to hold. So they use this term universal design, which by 1990 was known within a kind of small design, small design world as a certain kind of design ideal that meant um, addressing both disabled and non-disabled users ideally without separation, right? So there's definitely an awareness of disability related design in terms of things like, again, like wheelchair ramps and so on, but that these are often separate, right? They're sold in a different catalog or architecturally they're separate from, you know, the separate side entrance. And so um, designers in the, the 1980s had started to propose this notion of a universal design and that um, by incorporating disability related um, features into the mainstream environment, you might capture a broader audience. So here's a um, an illustration from an article, an architectural article about this. The term was coined by Ronald Mace, the same designer who desi who made that um, swooshing wheelchair that I showed in the beginning of the lecture. Um, but here's a, a drawing that kind of illustrates this notion. Here you have um, a woman kind of, you know, arms overloaded, holding groceries and bags and using her elbow to open the door. So it's a lever shaped door handle, something that's preferable for people also with some kind of manual impairment, right? Rather than a whole, uh, a door handle that you have to grasp. On the right hand side, this young boy is looking into a closet that has a series of pegs that allow you to um, adjust and adapt, um, you know, where the, the shelves and the bars are, which is great for a kid as they grow up over time, adjustable, but also usable by people of different heights, uh, wheelchair users, and so on. So this notion of universal design is one that makes the argument that by addressing a small segment of the population that's identified as disabled, you are likely to bring about design improvements for a broader population for, as Oxo Good Grips suggests, quote unquote, for everyone. Um, and this is a very idealized notion as well, right? That people with disabilities themselves may be incorporated into that broad everyone, right? That that this, these households might include children, 
you know, married women, older folks, um, as well, and, and, and that disability may be part of that household as well. Another thing to indicate about this image, however, and the term universal design is that it's very tactical, right? It's very smartly chosen by architects who have been working in the area of access and who themselves had disabilities um, in, you know, the 1970s and 1980s, right? Who had 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 the interactions with architects who thought, oh, this is just for some small population, why, or it's just a legal consideration, why should I care? And they, the term universal design, right, suggests something that's universally held, right, that's a good design idea. It's almost in a modernist sense, right, of kind of the standardized design. Similarly, these images suggest, right, a broader need for these kinds of features. Notably, there is no visible disability represented here, right? So the emphasis in many ways is on the advantages for non-disabled people. And we may consider now, you know, 30 years after the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, which passed in 1990, um, and, you know, 30, 35 years after the notion of universal design became um, widespread and understood in architecture, the extent to which it, it misses some ideas, right? By not deliberately pic uh, picturing disability, but also by emphasizing those aspects of design which can be easily incorporated into a universal solution, right? So things that are manually easily adjustable, things that are open and flexible are great examples of universal design. However, what about those features which can't be addressed in a universal way? Does this make them less important? Um, there are trade-offs when it comes to accessible design, and in more recent times, designers have, have begun to address these in more specific ways. Um, for example, in, in a range of products that we, we could term speculative, right, which are imaginative, hypothetical, performative, that propose various uses for design, which may not be commercially out in the world, but which cause us to think about um, the uses of design. So the MIT Media Lab, for example, is one site where, you know, sort of experimental designs are funded and encouraged. Um, sometimes with highly questionable funding, but we'll leave that to um, a different different topic. Um, but Kelly Dobson, for example, developed a series of what she called um, external organs in the MIT Media Lab in the late 1990s, early 2000s, where she suggested, you know, sort of functional objects that we could bring with us that might perform various, you know, functions that are sort of left un unmet by design. So for example, this screen body is somewhat like a, a handbag or backpack that you carry with you. And if you're having, um, you know, severe rage or anxiety, you might be able to just scream into it, right? So it addresses a few things that we haven't seen addressed when it comes to disability, right? Um, first of all, what we could call invisible disabilities like mental health, anxiety, depression, which are widespread and experienced, and experienced but are not incorporated into typical architectural um, uh, codes and so on for access. Um, but also, you know, something, the idea of a kind of personalized approach, right? Not something that's for everyone, not something that fits into a kind of universal ideal, but instead um, addresses a, a highly personal kind of issue and might be a matter of choice, might work for some people and might not work for others. Um, in his book, Design Meets Disability, the designer Graham Pullen noted these kinds of strategies and felt that there was a need for more of this kind of experimental, speculative approach that could really get into the issues of disability without having to justify them as universal. So in the book, he commissioned a number of designers to make imagined products, right? Things that they might not have been commissioned for, or might not be able to afford to make, um, but that might address this. So for example, Tomoko Azumi, who is a Japanese furniture maker who makes these very elegant um, stools and tables that kind of fold into each other and so on. Imagine the possibility of a specialized piece of furniture for herself as she's has very sh um, um, as she's on the smaller side or other people with short stature, st short stature such as people with dwarfism. So she suggests in here um, that the furniture would need to do a couple of things. Um, it would need to, as she says, ha um, be a little lift. So uh, on the right hand side, you can see that the word in, in pink, a little lift, but also, as you can see on the in pink text on the left, a little cough, right? So that the furniture would 
would call attention to it itself, would perform the function of having to like tap someone on the shoulder to make space for you when you're like at a crowded bar and then um, open up and provide a little lift to get to that that bar. So um, she didn't actually make this step, right? She's she. This is a hypothetical project, but she pictures it here in a series of collages that show herself frustrated at the bar, unable to approach it, but then, um, you know, an object that might kind of give her the social space of like making a little bit of attention to get people to stand aside. So something that is interesting as it opens up, makes space, um, is visible, right? Not something that's invisible that just blends in. And then uh, in the final image on the right, uh, gives that little step up. So this approach is one that's very rooted in design, but has sort of a different purpose to universal design, right? It doesn't seek to sort of blend in, but to actually make make, make um, attention and make space for disability. Some other designers have also worked kind of in this vein. Sarah Hendren, a designer um, in in Bo the Boston area, um, has coined the the term "design for one" to suggest the idea of instead of uh, universal design a very targeted design for a very specific situation. So here she designed a one-step ramp that ha that could serve two very specific populations, wheelchair users in the city and skateboarders, right? Two populations who use city space in unexpected ways and who often interact with steps and curbs in a very specific way. So this one step um, is something that can easily be um, unfolded and opened um, and adjusted height-wise to a single step, which would, especially in older cities like Boston are very common, right? That there's sort of the one step or an awkward step into a store and things like that. So this would adjust for that. But it also provides a kind of playful and interesting ramp that can be combined for the kind of city tricks that... Um, that, that skateboarders use. So again, the, we have some similarity to universal design in terms of paying attention to a very specific population, but rather than trying to then respond to it with a solution that could address, you know, quote unquote, everyone, she keeps it at that highly um, specific approach. Another aspect of Hendren's work, which I think also um, gives sort of another angle on this, is looking at um, design that emerges out of disabled people's own experiences. So just as those images that I showed in the beginning of the lecture that showed, um, for example, you know, FDR's own design for his house or those, um, those very practical do-it-yourself products um, that were being circulated within the polio community, um, Sarah Hendren and her students have, have done um, design research to reveal how disabled people use everyday technologies themselves and in fact have called this what they call engineering at home, right? So which is giving a, a label to these kinds of activities that's more than adaptation or just personal products to a kind of technological work that's being done by disabled people. So this is for a special um, workshop, uh, sorry, a special website that Hendren, um, her, her colleague, Katrin Lynch and their students at Olin College developed with a um, disabled woman named Cindy who had had a significant um, surgery that required um, ampute partial amputation of her hand. Um, and they documented all of the things that she uses in her home on an everyday basis. So you can sort of see them scattered out here, a range of products from both that are high tech and designed and that are more um, on the home homemade front. So here are some examples, um, you know, a carefully sewn mitt made out of a washcloth that she uses, other products where she's attached, various, um, uh, you know, household products that she um, chooses and so on, and each one is cataloged by the students and identified. So for example, we have the myoelectric hand, a high-tech, you know, uh, hand that can move and operate in which she describes that she really doesn't use that much. It's too complex. It's very heavy. Um, she has to use a special software to update it and so on. So you have the example of like the very specifically designed um, as well as things that she's customized for herself. So here you see she uses soft tubing to make her own sort of reinforced handles for things like her hairbrush, her lipstick, and so on. So you have this mix of the, the high tech and the do-it-yourself 
in the reality of this person's life. And from the standpoint of the class, the idea of engineering at home, right, is that there are key lessons of adaptation and practicality that could be informative for people who are designing with and for people with disabilities, right? That engineers, rather than imagining what disabled people need, could actually ask them and engage with um, their population. This kind of approach of documenting what is in the landscape and what pe um, people are already doing to observe and use it is also a kind of design strategy in itself for developing um, new designs. I want to draw some kind of connection also with the work that Sarah and her students did with the kind of political history that's going on in the so same moment, right? That as we saw universal design is emerging kind of at the same time as the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed, the landmark civil rights law that required accessibility, not only in government functions, which it had before, but in private businesses, right? So in workplaces, in movie theaters and grocery stores and so on. Um, but that law also was somewhat vexed, was kind of limited in its ambition. So, um, for example, this this bumper sticker, I feel, always says it all. It's from ADAPT, one of the primary activist organizations of the period, with this, um, you know, symbol, the international symbol of access with a person breaking free of their chains, saying free our people, and supporting the Americans with Disabilities Act with, with the phrase to boldly go where everyone else has gone before. Right, suggesting both the boldness and the extreme normal normalcy of the demands of accessibility, right? That disabled people in the period of the ADA were asking for requirements that would bring them simply to equality, not to any sort of, you know, ambitious beyond. But today we live with the results of that act, which are very mixed, right? As I mentioned, the wheelchair ramp that's blocked, the elevator that doesn't function, a very um, weak system of enforcement for these uh, requirements such that there's very little check to make sure that um, accessibility is functional at any given time. Um, and it's still a very mild kind of reaction from the architecture world who are, were, were never super enthusiastic about incorporating these um, features. So this sense that accessibility has been an an incomplete project, right? It has only gone sort of where everyone else had already been before um, in terms of ambition is maybe also reflected in some of these projects that seek to not necessarily invent a new exciting thing, but to document what is really happening and what are the everyday lived experiences of disability. Um, another project that I just wanted to highlight in relationship to this is the Mapping Access Project at Critical Design Lab at Vanderbilt University, which was um, which was initiated by a colleague of mine, Amy Hamray, who's also a historian of sort of access and design. And um, when Amy arrived at Vanderbilt, they realized that the campus did not have an, a, an accessibility map. So it was actually quite difficult to kind of figure out what the levels of access were. And so rather than simply asking the school to go through and like mark each building with like, where is this wheelchair ramp, Hamry um, initiated this collective kind of crowdsource project in which groups of people got, um, came together and surveyed the campus all together for a range of accessibility um, uh, levels. So not just, you know, where is the accessible entrance, but how does it connect to other features of access? Where, how do you get from the, the accessible entrance to the accessible bathroom? Or how does, access, how does accessibility link with other forms of inclusion, like, for example, nursing rooms or gender um, neutral bathrooms or, um, you know, meeting spaces for students um, and so on. So this kind of mapping access project produces a range of kinds of information that then are incorporated into Google Maps, right, which since Google Maps has the capability to be, um, to add, you know, to, to make specialized maps and, and annotate sites. Um, as a result of this project, the university actually adopted this crowdsourcing approach as its ADA plan. So um, they incorporated, you know, student, faculty, and staff surveys of their buildings as a way to plan, um, and has also required that the wheelchair entrance be the uh, the wheelchair accessible entrance be the main entrance for any building. So if we think about that, you know, it could no longer be the side entrance. So they had to they actually in some cases like moved earth in order to reorient the entrance to a building. Um, so uh, this project, you know, maybe fits somewhat into 
the the themes that we've seen here, right? Where it it fully takes takes the universal design notion that accessibility is not just limited to one single population, right? And that it's not centered in kind of one specialized fix, but instead that an attention to what's missing in a, in a space can actually address a much broader population. But at the same time, it also um, takes on some of the kind of, um, you know, participatory and ongoing dimensions of some of the other sort of more experimental projects that we've seen, asking um, questions about environments rather than simply providing the answer, right? Making this into an ongoing um, kind of design project. So in keeping with that spirit, um, in this remote lecture, um, in this time where we're um, attending school in a really unexpected way, um, I'll ask you to just, you know, think a little bit and perhaps respond in the, the comments and discussion boards for today's class. You know, thinking about our campus, what are the most and least accessible parts of SAIC? for you, right? I'm not asking you to imagine some, you know, other population, but for yourself, you know, what are, what makes SAIC accessible, inclusive, um, and connected, and what are the barriers? Further, you know, now that we've shifted to this remote process, what are the accessibility benefits of this format? What new access issues does this format raise, right? Knowing that this is probably not the only time we're going to be operating in this way. What are some of the bigger picture issues that we're experiencing? Um, and then finally, just what other examples come to mind for you that reflect either a universal approach or this more customized kind of design for one approach? Um, what are, you know, what are some of the other examples? Just it's always helpful to kind of amass those, but also to think in terms of what kind of access and what kind of design process does um, a, a particular approach represent? Thank you.